Hey, look at that. Oh. Calling Chris Anderson a very well dressed Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling a a very dapper Rick Byer in Chicago, it looks like you're in Chicago. I am in Chicago. We're we're back home. This is the one week and then you'll be on the road again and then after that the whole thing goes history happy hour, constantly moving and yep. traveling. Um but welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Chris and I do travel the globe uh, frequently, uh, but we still manage to be here on Sundays, whether you like it or not, to have a cocktail and talk about history. And today, uh, we're going to be talking about Nazis again, as we, uh, in this case, Nazi billionaires, as we have so many times in the, how many shows have we done, Chris? A um, hundred, I think. 100. 100, believe this it or not. This is our 100th episode. Didn't you say that this was only something we were going to do for a couple of weeks? <laughs> I, I, just hearing the words 100th episode come out of my mouth, it's a little bit like, wow. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's shows that were f- TV shows that people loved that didn't get to 100 episodes. I don't know. But we've surpassed, we've gotten, yeah. and there's us, which is different in so many ways from that. Um, but, but Chris, I thought, uh, since it's our 100th episode, well, first of all, we did dress for the occasion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, <clears throat> you're doing the Empire Proud there. Uh, oh, and and tell me about that wonderful sweater you're wearing. What the, my Mr. Rogers sweater was, was knit by my lovely wife, and I thought I'd wear it here on the 100th episode. Check that out. I know. Check that out. That's Anna has made Chris a 100th anniversary, a 100th episode sweater. <laughs> sweater. I wanted to know if it has it's a little crest. the last crest one I'm going to get. <laughs> I wanted to know if it has a little crest on it underneath, uh, but, but no. possibly not. Uh, but Chris, I thought we should do a toast. Uh, we I have, should. I, I have some champagne right here, as I think you may I as well. Yeah. So, uh, so what, on our 100th show, what should we toast? We should toast... Uh, our viewers, our loyal viewers, yes. Our so Patreon subscribers, particularly, yes. To make it all possible, our guests for coming on the show and giving one us of whom is patiently them. standing by uh, right now, wondering why he doesn't have a glass of champagne. But he's, and you, Rick. Oh, oh and you, you, Chris. It's great. It's fun. Here you go. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. And we hope everybody else is uh, is toasting with us and. You know, when we play the open, when I when I made this open, you know, 82 episodes ago or whenever it was, I didn't realize when I put that champagne uh, See? cork in there that it was going to be uh, something prophetic. that would come in prophetic to the 100th, uh, 100th episode. But Chris, I think, okay, we've made okay. people wait long enough. It's time to get so. started. Give us the cue. <laughs> Bar is open, and Chris, what is on tap today? Well, it's um, a fascinating uh, new book by uh, David de Jong, who is a journalist uh, who has covered European banking and finance from Amsterdam and New York. He's written for Bloomberg. Um, his uh, writing has appeared in lots of journals you may have heard of, such as the Wall Street Journal, Dutch Financial Daily, Bloomberg, Business Week, uh, and he's hopefully. Uh, once all of this book stuff is done, going to be moving back to Tel Aviv, uh, where he's going to continue to write. But he's done a new book uh, called Nazi Billionaires, which is, as the cover says, the dark history of Germany's wealthiest dynasties, which is getting quite a bit of coverage. So, David, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. And congratulations. Here's wow. to you. Oh, look at that. Here's Here's to you about <laughs> 100 episodes. That's quite... Um, Yes, it, it's a milestone yeah, for it sure. It is a milestone. Absolutely. It should be celebrated. Milestones should always be celebrated. Absolutely, exactly. Um, so, but but you're a lot more interesting than our hundredth anniversary. So we want to dive right into the book here. And I, I was I, I wrote this down because I wanted to read um, something that was in a New York Times essay which you had just written, uh, which kind of leads into the discussion. And in this essay, you say that uh, remembrance culture has been a central component of German society. In cafes from Berlin to Frankfurt and from Hamburg to Munich, there are daily conversations about collective guilt and atonement. These are reflective, nuanced, and above all, aware. Yet this movement towards facing the past is somehow bypassing many of Germany's most revered tycoons and their dark histories. 
So could you tell us which tycoons you're talking about and uh, what what do we need to be more aware of? So the, the, the book, my book focuses on five uh, families and their and their patriarchs. So it is uh, Gunter Quant and his sons uh, Herbert and Harold. Uh, the children of Herbert today control BMW, or the majority, or the controlling shareholders of BMW. There is uh, Friedrich Flick, very notorious, probably Germany's most notorious industrialist of the 20th century, who was convicted at Nuremberg um, for crimes against humanity and war crimes. He controlled. Um, one of the largest privately held steel, coal, and weapons conglomerates during the Third Reich. And when he was released, when, when uh, the Americans commuted his, his sentence for, uh, uh, on good behavior, um, and when he was released within a decade, he was the controlling shareholder of Daimler-Benz. Um, so that's the second uh, patriarch and, and dynasty. And then thirdly, there's the Von Fink family, which is the financier's family, uh, which co-founded Allianz and Munich Re, the, the global insurers. And they also uh, co-founded a private bank called Merck Fink. Um, fourthly, there's the Porsche Pierre family, uh, whose uh, patriarchs Ferdinand uh, Porsche famously designed the Volkswagen uh, or, and, and convinced Hitler to put it into production. Uh, his son-in-law, Anton Pierre, who he uh, co-founded uh, the Porsche design firm with and who he led very brutally uh, the Volkswagen factory cam complex with, and their son, Ferry Porsche, who designed, uh, or uh, Ferdinand Porsche's son, Ferry, who designed the first Porsche sports car after the war. And then fifthly, there's the Utker conglomerate, uh, mostly known in Europe uh, for... Um, they're baking goods products, but they own also a chain of luxury, uh, luxury hotels like the Lanesboro, very famously in London, um, and or Le Bristol in, in Paris, and uh, um, the one uh, Rock uh, Ein Rock in 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 Cap And their um, their patriarch Rudolf August Hütger joined the Waffen SS voluntarily, uh, grew up in a very ideological Nazi household, and then built up. His family company, Dr. Utker, into one of Germany's uh, largest conglomerates post-war. Um, so those are the five. So um, you, in your book, you take a, a deep dive into the financial history of these families and their very close ties with the Nazis, or in some cases, they are really Nazis themselves. So I, I'm guessing that writing this book was not sort of a pleasant lark for you. Uh, it's some pretty dark stuff that you had to yeah. spend years on. So why did you undertake this investigation? How did you get started? I mean, I got I got started on it when I was reporting for Bloomberg News from New York, actually, on the topic. Um, I joined a team which investigated billion fortune, billion, billion dollar fortunes and privately held companies, pri privately owned companies by families. So, of course, Bloomberg's strength is Covering uh, listed uh, stock exchange listed uh, companies, and and um, this was a team that also really looked into family owned and non stock exchange listed companies, uh, a hidden wealth, and as I said, um, billion dollar fortunes controlled by families. I was actually hired as one of the America reporter or one of the reporters covering North America, so covering the Coke Coke Industries and the Coke Brothers, uh, the Waltons and Walmart. Uh, real estate fortunes, but I was soon asked because I'm a native Dutchman uh, to cover the to add the um, German speaking countries to my beat. And what I quickly found there were, you know, these these massive family controlled fortunes and companies today, and who, particularly with BMW and Porsche, where they are, where they are pretending to have reckoned with, 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 with their family history or pretending to be, um, you know, to have come clean about it while in fact they're leaving it out and they're kind of whitewashing it through these global foundation in, in the names of their, uh, of their exalted patriarchs or founders or saviors, uh, celebrating their business successes, but, but leaving out their war, their war crimes that they committed or their uh, Nazi affiliations that they had. 
and um, you know the book in it in the end is a argument in favor of historical transparency if you want to conduct global philanthropy in the names of these men you know and and one wants to learn something from history don't only show and celebrate their business successes but also um, be transparent about the dark side uh, uh, of these men so they, one of the things that really sh struck me reading the book is um how i don't know if, if colorless is the right word for some of these guys but they're pretty banal people you know yeah. could, could you could you just i mean not to give too much away but just take one of the one of the founders of one of these companies and, yeah. and as an example say how, where does he come from how does he get where he's going yeah sure let me let me take the the main as i view as the main character which is gunter quant who was the patriarch of the of the Quant dynasty today? Germany's wealthiest uh, business dynasty, um, whose heirs, two of their heirs, control BMW uh, today. Um, you know, he was he grew up in a uh, in a textile manufacturing family outside of Berlin, in rural you know rural Germany, and he managed to get control. You know, he had larger ambitions for himself. And after World War One, he moved to Berlin and quickly ended up profiting from the hyper hyperinflation that befell the Weimar Republic, as, as Germany was called at the time or known informally, um, the hyperinflation that, that befell uh, the Weimar Republic after World War One, you know, buckling under the stringent reparations that were imposed on Germany uh, under the Treaty of Versailles. Um, hyperinflation, you know, caused people are, you know, wiped out basically all the wealth for the middle class, for the Germany's middle class. But speculators were able to profit greatly from it. Um, so did another main character in my book, Friedrich Flick. But Günther Quant managed to parlay um, part of his wealth into getting control over a battery factory in Berlin or a battery company that was based in Berlin. It was a global company called AFA and a weapons manufacturer called uh, DWM um, and that laid kind of the, the groundwork for the for the quant business empire. Now, not only did he do that, he also met, he was a widower, his wife died in the Spanish flu, his first wife, Ant uh, uh, Antonia. And on a train trip from Berlin, on a business trip from Berlin to central Germany, he meets a 17 year old girl uh, or teenage girl, um, uh, who is his name is Magda Friedlander, who he gets, who he marries, he quickly, he's 37 at the time, who he quickly uh, asks for a hand and marries, and they have one son, Harold, uh, but the in the late 20s, their, their, their marriage dissolves. I mean, they're, com they're a complete mismatch from the start, basically. She's interested in money and power. He's interested in, you know, having a wife, basically. <laughs> And yeah, check I mean, exactly. Check. <laughs> I'm a I'm a rich industrialist. I need a wife, and she they divorce, and she remarries to a man named Joseph Goebbels, who is then a who when they meet is the um, district chief for 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 the Nazi party in, for the Bergening Nazi party in uh, in Berlin, and um, the campaign manager and the propaganda manager for the or, or leader for the Nazi party. And uh, well, they become, you know, obviously Magda and Josef Goebbels become the, the most notorious couple, arguably even, you know, I would say on par with, with, with Hitler and Eva, Adolf Hitler and Eva Brown. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot, you know, well, this, and it's all, yeah, no, this all I, happens prior I, to 1933. So, but there's a, you, you write about this, there's this amazing interplay between the, uh, uh, Joseph Goebbels, uh, his wife Magda, uh, uh, Gunter uh, Quant, uh, and and um, you know, and kind of an argument after the war, right? Because Quant essentially uh, he's involved in a lot of things that are um, uh, pretty atrocious yeah. things, but after the war, he's like, oh, you know, I was forced to do this. Yeah. I was forced to be. In, what is, was he the, in Himmler's? A circle of friends. No, he, he was not. Oh, but he no, was. He but was he not. was a, sub, a supporter. And, well, and no, I mean, he, he profited on every. He benefited yeah. on every level from 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 the Nazi regime's rearmament policies, from their mass use of 
forced enslaved labor, from the expropriation of, of Jewish-owned companies and companies that, that happened to lie in, in Nazi-occupied territories. I mean, he was one of the, Kurt Quant became one of the largest uh, industrialists of the Third Reich. So, David, one of the questions I have, and I know it's it's like one of these unanswerable um, questions about the Third Reich, is what did the, what did these industrialists see in Hitler? You know, when when they get involved, they get involved fairly early. He's at that point sort of a non-entity, and I mean, you right. even have you even have Quant saying, "I can't say that Hitler made a significant or meaningless, right. uh, sympathetic or repulsive impression on me. He struck me as perfectly average." Yeah, so, I mean, so where do they say, okay, but he's our guy? Well, they say it. At the, I mean, they found Germany's big business found found Hitler to be when he first when he first started his rise in the, in the mid nineteen twenties until I would say December September nineteen thirty when the Nazi Party had their first electoral success. Uh, you know, for the first five, six years, they found the uh, Germany businessmen found uh, or big business found the Nazi party to be, you know, boorish, garish, you know, outlandish characters from the from the impoverished hinterlands, from the provincial from the provincial parts of Germany. And they couldn't they didn't want anything to do with it. You know, these were not this was not an establishment party. It was only after October 1929 with the start of the Great Depression, the implosion of of, uh, of the New York New York Stock Exchange, or at least you know Black Black Monday, and um, you know mass unemployment hitting Germany extremely hard. In the wake of the Nazi Party's first electoral success in September 1930, a campaign led by by Joseph Goebbels, that is the point where Hitler starts reaching out. To, I mean, mind you, Hitler also does not have any business connections. Right, I mean, yeah, he has yeah. there's, there's, there's two famous industrialists, Fritz Thyssen uh, and Hermann Röchling, who are like their, his first uh, industrialist supporters. But for five, six years, there is no support from yeah. business for Hitler. So it's only then when Hitler starts asking his economic uh, advisor um, to to reach out to, to businessmen and financiers. Uh, and they have all these meetings at a hotel in Berlin yeah. uh, near the, the, the Reichschancery. Uh, and that is, you know, and they're still quite skeptical because Germany is so volatile politically and economically at this point that they're like, okay, you know, there's a new chancellor every year or every three months or every six months. So it's only when he sees his power in January or on January 3rd of 1933, and in the weeks following that, that they're that they are throwing. I mean, they don't even do it. I mean, most of these men were not Nazi support. Were not. Were not. Right. I mean, they signed up. They became members of of of, uh, of 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 the Nazi Party. Most of them, I write about. So, uh, you know, they were in fact members of the Nazi Party. Were most of these men ideologues? No, they were right. sheer opportunists. Um, so yeah, it, there's, yeah, it just, it just strikes me because I mean, this class of people tend to be, um, certainly educated, certainly not foolish. Yeah. And, and yet they just, they just open their checkbooks and they say, yep, that's great. And, yeah. and I, I've often wondered why a few of them aren't saying, no, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe there's a different, I mean, within their goals, maybe there was a different alternative, but, but you talk about these meetings where they just whip out their checkbook and say, you know. How much? Yeah, I mean, they saw. I think they saw an opportunity also to for what for them what they perceived as to be a stable period for Germany, right? And 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 of course, this being uh, the Great Depression, and there's millions of people are unemployed. Um, they they see an opportunity, and and with a rearmament that that Hitler promises. They see an opportunity to 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 benefit um, um, from, uh, or you know, to revive their companies as well. I mean, huh. yeah, the, the the German economy, the global economy, was in the pits, and um, you know, they didn't, you know, if they could profit from all its horrible, all its awful discriminatory legislation, 
you know they would they would not they wouldn't mind that you know or, or for, you know it, it, it you know the goalposts was was the goalposts of morality were moved further and further yeah, yeah. and with every play and play they went they went along well as the goalposts of of morality were moved uh, they got involved and you've touched on it a little bit but i'd love if you could talk a little bit more sure. about some of the things that these businessmen were involved with that go, you know, kind of far beyond, the, you know, doing business. Uh, you know, we're, we're just businessmen. We happen to be here in Nazi Germany, sure. but they are involved in slave labor and sure. uh, and other things. Talk a little bit about that and and some of the, uh, I would say, crimes isn't too strong a word that they were involved no, in. Certainly, certainly, that is certainly not too strong a word. That's the right description of it. I mean, it starts innocuous with 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 um, Germany's. Re with the initiation of uh, of German rearmament under Hitler, uh, secretly at first, um, because it goes against the uh, Treaty of Versailles, under which uh, Germany had to disarm completely. You know, you have soon from 1930 from 1934 onwards, you have billions of Reichsmark flowing into the coffers of of German businesses uh, to build up, to you know, to 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 going from 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 the nazi regime to the coffers of, of of german companies to build up rearmament to start mastering produce mass producing arm, arms and, and all sorts of weaponry and then from 1935 onwards with the implementation of the nuremberg race laws this other component comes in which is the you know the increasing disenfranchisement disenfranchisement of of, of jewish citizens uh of germany um which starts with you know the uh, you know the, the, the removal of citizenship uh for jewish german citizens um but also deals with their their de facto expropriation of their assets um so there's this term which i use a lot in the book called arianization yeah. which is the removal of the Jewish element from an asset, right? Whether that was a Jewish owned business or a, or the, the, the Jewish element of ownership from an asset, whether that was a Jewish owned business, uh, land, um, houses, jewelry, art, you know, anything of relative value. Um, and, you know, I give many examples in the book of that very insidious, uh, uh, you know, practice which started out, which had, of course, this being Germany, it had to have the veneer of a normal Le legalization, business. right? Exactly, it's all exactly. Technically the veneer, legal. exactly. Technically legal. It starts out. I mean, even though they are, even though most of the business, or no, I mean, almost all of the business owners are, if not all, are forced to sell their assets far under the market value. Of, the Jewish uh, business owners. The Jewish right. business owners far under the market value uh, of 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 the of the of their assets, um, and later, I mean, later it it goes into outright a, a seizure and expropriation of their assets, um, which are then transferred into the hands of of, of the men that I'm writing about. And but I, I, I yeah. also heard. No, I was just going to say that um, that um, I, I have always kind of mentally imagined this as something that the government is doing, but the government is setting up a, a sort of a structure and then saying to the businessmen, go, you do it, you know, and the businessmen are going, okay, because, uh, hey, because I can now own the company by buying uh, my partner here out. Uh, for a quarter of the value or a tenth yeah. of the value and you yeah. kind of have to take the deal because otherwise uh you, and it happens in some yeah. cases you don't take the deal and it ends, ends up getting seized anyway yeah exactly or you, or you receive nothing for exactly you receive nothing for it so it's a it's so it's it's you know it's um do if you you know uh you know it's do or die you know in a way and, and part of literally and part, and part of these businesses that these families now still control are built on these businesses that were Aryanized, right? So, you know. Well, no, I mean, all the, most of the assets were either, I mean, it depended, right? After the war, either um, if they were in Soviet uh, occupied territories, no, they were, true. they were expropriated by the, by the Soviet Union. And then of course, after the reunification for Germany, 
um, the, the the legal the, the rightful heirs try to get the assets back okay. in in East Germany, or you know they were restituted, uh, or they were at least the heirs try to get restitution for the companies that or the shares or the buildings uh, that were stolen mm. uh, from them or 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 so or or bought from them far under the actual market value of right. an asset. Um, it is not the case that there are, or at least not the companies I'm writing about, where there is still kind of a basis of organization of the companies they control okay, okay. today. Okay. But on the other hand, they certainly, uh, these businesses, uh, another thing that they're involved in extensively is uh, the use of slave labor, forced yeah. labor, yeah. often uh, uh people who are worked to death or, you know, killed yeah. in various other ways. Yeah. And and that is kind of the basis to some degree of their of the continued fortunes that they've created. Well, in the, in the sense that, of course, you know, as German men get drafted and called up to the front, there's a huge labor sh shortage uh, during World War Two in Germany. So what happens is, is the largest coercive labor program that the world has ever seen is initiated by the Nazi regime. And millions and millions of men, women, and, and children are rounded up in, in the streets of Europe, all over Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, um, Southern Europe, Northern Europe, and are deported to German mines and factories, where um, you know where they are either forced to work for doing forced labor, which meant they were paid a pittance, or or use a slave labor, which was meant that they that they didn't receive anything for the work. So. In a sense, you're right with what you're saying because there was a continuation of labor that kept these companies afloat during uh, World War II, um, which else they would have had to shut down and they had to suspend production. Um, yeah, because there was such a uh, severe labor shortage. Of course, another aspect is, of course, concentration camp labor is the, the SS maintaining concentration camps across Nazi occupied territory and in Nazi Germany itself. And men, there were many collaborations between very well known companies today um, and concentration camps where, where, where men and women um, were, were sent to work in Volkswagen factory, uh, BMW, uh, Daimler, I mean, Siemens, um, uh, you know, as, as slaves. So David, could you under the most horrific circumstances, and could you talk a bit about that? Because one of the things I, sure. I know that has shocked me a bit, um, that I don't don't think people are really aware of, is that the talk about how the industrialists are paying the SS yes. for yeah, the yeah, labor. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So they, they have to be aware of what's going on, right? If they're sure, of course. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So there was a deal where they leased. I mean, it's. You know, it's, it's as sick. It's as sick as you get it. I mean, at least concentration camp inmates for they paid six Reichsmark for unskilled labor to the SS. These companies that I'm writing about, and many others too, and nine and nine Reichsmark per day per per captive uh, for skilled labor to the SS. I mean, it's yeah. yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> did you? Um... Reading the book, it's sort of, you know, as always, it seems to me, reading books about Nazi Germany, it's this descent into hell that, uh, right. you know, everybody sort of starts off thinking it's politics as usual or business yeah. as usual or we can control Hitler or we can work with this guy. And then eventually you, you go down to the you know seventh circle or whatever of hell. Yeah, exactly. um, did you run across anything... Um, where any one of these people, even in private, said, wait a minute, we, we, we're helping make this happen and we're helping him, you know, do this by, by all the stuff we're doing and we're very complicit. This is really not something we should be involved in. Any qualms no. from anybody? No, 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 there was zero, none, no reflection whatsoever. And in the years, of the four years I spent doing this research from Germany and the decade I've spent reporting on this topic I, I have not come across any of that or at least not from the families that were involved in the book that, that were writing about in the book so wow. i mean i have one there's one incidence where 
actually uh, where one character in the book was was a, was a Nazi I was a totally convinced Nazi even to the detriment of his business which is the Utker or uh, Rudolf August Utker's stepfather Richard Kasolowski where his stepson Rudolf August Utker is going to acquire a house from a Jewish man and and who had to flee who was a tobacco executive in Hamburg where to who fled to to Germany sorry to Aus, uh, Australia to um uh, yeah uh, and his house is for sale um and and his stepfather warns him if this is 1937 1938 you know tears stick to this house you know his Nazi stepfather I mean I, I that stuck with me because that is of course a very Poetic, yeah, it was very out yeah. of uh, a, a very uh, out of out of character remark for for any of the characters that I read. But given given, I, mean, I want to get into the post war stuff sure. you know, in a minute. But just all the stuff leading up to the war, you know, these guys building their empire, rise of the Nazis, World War Two. Was there anything that that really kind of struck you or surprised you, or that you didn't expect to find, or was or were you kind of, you know? Did you have an idea of what you were going to find before you got there or, or you know i think i hoped for maybe naively that there was exactly the kind of reflection that that yeah. uh, that you pointed out i think i was struck by that the callousness was so much worse than i expected it to be yeah, yeah. yeah. So you get uh, the, the war the war comes to an end mm -hmm. and many of the folks that you profiled are in fact uh, arrested uh, or mm -hmm. detained uh, yeah. uh, by uh, often by the Americans uh, yeah. for their complicity with the Nazis. But yeah. as you write, most of them manage to evade any really serious punishment or financial penalty. It's not too long before it's business as usual again. The dynasties flourish. So, what happened? Well, what happens is that the Cold War <laughs> starts, and uh, and and Nazi Germany is quickly forgotten um, and its perpetrators and uh, you know the big enemy becomes the Soviet Union and of course uh, West Germany being the you know still is well Germany now a reunified Germany still still is today but West Germany is um, Europe's largest and most strong strongest economy and uh, the US wants a viable partner as a bulwark against uh, against the Soviet Union, uh, encroaching Soviet Union, and um, you know policy changes quickly accelerate from 1947 onwards, which sees most of the handho handover of of, Nazi, of suspected Nazi perpetrators and sympathizers to the Germans themselves, and a very flawed legal process is initiated called denazification. A word we all hear a lot these days because it's what Putin uses uh, as a, a justification of what he's doing in Ukraine, which is beyond obscene and perverse and horrific. Because you talk about denazification about a country with a Jewish president, I mean, it's just you know, again, beyond. Um, and this process of denazification sees. With the exception of Friedrich Flick in my book, all the main characters in my book um, um, get off scot free, and, or with can, a fine at best. Can I do a follow yeah, up, Chris? Absolutely. absolutely. I, you you introduce a word, a concept I had never heard before. I was mm -hmm. quite fascinated by, and I might say it wrong, but a personal sure. personal shine. Yeah, personal shine. Yeah. Uh, explain yeah. what that is, and yeah. and why it becomes a, a factor, and something these families are 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 desperate for, and and maybe are you know sort of in some ways buying to kind of buy their way out of this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In in the concept of personal shine, so a personal shine was a parcel ticket. So parcel is 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 a is a laundry. It's literally it's a it's a very famous laundry detergent, actually produced by one of. Uh, in part produced by Unilever, but also in part produced by the uh, by Henkel, which is controlled by the Henkel family, one of Germany's also most of famous uh, industrialist families. And um, a personal shine, a, 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 a personal ticket, is a is a ticket to is a ticket to be washed clean, or a tongue-in-cheek expression, deeply cynical expression, 
should be washed clean of Nazi sympathies and 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 any any affiliation with Nazi crimes in these denazification processes. Of course, you know there were millions. They had to denazify millions of Germans, right? So for the common German who was suspected of these things, one personal shine was often, which meant a statement attesting to somebody's, you know, apolitical, anti-Nazi stance, um, uh, uh, affiliation with with the with the resistance, uh, or reformed, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, he's now a reformed man or woman. Uh, was enough to 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 get the label denazified or uh, entlasted, uh, which means exonerated in German. There were five categories in 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 uh, where one could be put in, uh, where one could be ruled in, under uh, a denazification panel or trial or process. that depended also on the occupation zone. Of course, for the men I'm writing about, they needed much more than one personal shine. These were, you know, Germany's most powerful and most notorious industrialists and financiers. So we were also whose denazification trials were much more high profile and the charges against them much more serious. So they, you know, end up collecting 30, 40 to, you know, hundreds of personal shines of personal tickets to attest to their, you know, supposed uh, uh, anti-Nazi, uh, apolitical, uh, even victimhood under the Nazi regime. <laughs> and the most powerful of personal shines were, of course, those provided by men and women who were either from a Jewish background or with a Jewish connection. So, and they were called, I mean, cynically called alibi Jews. You know, I mean, I mean, after everything that you know, these people tend to, I mean, these people were still very powerful after the war, you know, um, they may were, they may have been detained. Most of their assets may have been, part of their assets may have been expropriated in, in the Soviet occupied territories and the Americans or the allies were investigating them. But you know, these, these men and their connections and their names and their companies still hold, held a lot of sway, even under American occupation. And they had to compare, consider every move that they were making. You know, but there were still a lot of people who, in, there were still people who either, you know, and even those from, from, you know, even those from Jewish descent or with Jewish connections or who had survived or had fled to the U.S., some of them that they had even helped prior to the war um, um, or helped fleeing, um, that were willing, for those reasons or for other reasons, to provide uh, a, a, a statement attesting to these things or attesting how they help them, you know, without going into what they, because of course, many of the men and women who provide these statements, of course, also were not aware what these men had actually done during the war or, or the companies that they had acquired from, from Jews. I mean, this was all very hush hush. You know, it wasn't as if these were op open, open secrets because so, they were not for the most part ideologues. So you say in the book, and this is kind of a continuation of what we've been talking about here, it says, but as was typical of the Allied authorities, the tycoon's brutal labor practices weren't even a point of interest yeah. for the French government. Yeah. Now, you know, at the end of the war, the, the newsreels of the concentration camps are, are everywhere. They march German civilians past camps, the Allies. Sure. Everybody knows about this. How is that so quick, so, the crime that enormous so quickly overlooks? You know, I think the, the, the relation between Big business and 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 concentration camps were was not that well pub, was not that known publicly. I mean, I think in the grand scheme of things, in the chaos that was post-war Germany, post-war Europe, um, you know, the the kind of institutionalized collaboration between German business and the Nazi regime was not really a topic of discussion. The focus was very much on the political and the military leadership. Of course, you know, under Nuremberg, you have the industrialist trials, which sees Friedrich Flick and his associates get indicted and convicted. Alfred Krupp 
and his associates get indicted and convicted, and the entire board from IG Farben, um, the world's largest uh, chemical and pharmaceuticals company, gets indicted and convicted. Um, so there are these trials, but you know, there's such a discrepancy between what ends up what end up what ends up to a larger audience. You know, um, this a lot of this information, and I think many people must have thought too that these were just the an, an exceptions. I don't think pe people it was not kind of ingrained. It never became ingrained until much later in global conscious or or, 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 or European or American conscious that how how deep the ties were between at least when it came to to force and slave labor how deep the ties were between between the Nazi regime and German business I mean that that came only in the 70s 80s 90s mm -hmm. many decades after the fact yeah. and so and to get back to your question you know the allies are not I mean, the whole concept of forced and slave labor also in the Nuremberg trials, in the Nazi-list Nuremberg trials, sure, but like in the main Nuremberg trial, of course, also the, the Holocaust, you know, these were not massive. These were, they, they, they were, you know, they were barely, they were very rarely referenced um, in trial, on, in, in the trials, you know, it was, it was not the institu institutionalized relation of that was not yeah it was not not so much reference and there was just not a, a big interest on the allied governments to for some to focus on forced and slave labor in their own trials and prosecuting these men and women uh, or for prosecuting these men it's 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 bizarre but it was that was mm. it was it was the case they, they glossed over it they didn't also want to deal with the victimhood to an extent it was not something that became a point, of course, at that at that point in time, right? Of course, later, from the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, with the rise of, of Holo with, with the rise of, of Holocaust awareness, and of course, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, the plight of forced slave labor becomes much more prominent um, uh, in in Europe and in the, in the United States. Your um, your anger pulsates through this book and it's not just to be very clear it's not a diatribe it's a it's an investigation and you're a journalist but your anger is there uh at least i i what i see is your anger your wrath about what you feel these families got away with and i wonder kind of in this whole scope of investigation what kind of made you the the angriest or most made you shake your head Wow, so many times. I mean, there were so many things where, I was, where it's it's very hard to choose one because it's. I mean, the reason why I started writing the book was because I was just st struck by the fact that by the blatant whitewashing that is happening today in the name of you know Ferry Porsche or Herbert Quant, where you have these mass global foundations, uh, you know, doing good things. You know, let's not make any mistake about that. But in the name of of men who, again, who committed war crimes, who, who voluntarily applied to the SS, and that history, you know, by some of the most powerful companies and or most well-known companies, most powerful families in the world, is completely left out. And I think that is that is the reason that gave me the that gave me the reason to write this book. Uh, and to at least, at the very bare minimum, argue for historical transparency on on the part of these companies like BMW and Porsche, uh, because you know, particularly the BMW Herbert Kwan Foundation, which has this motto: "Inspire responsible leadership." On the basis of Herbert Kwan saving <laughs> BMW from bankruptcy in 1959, but leaving out the fact that he you know, plan, build and construct, plan, build and dismantle a subconcentration camp in Nazi occupied Poland, had the responsibility over battery factories in Berlin with thousands of forced and slave laborers, including 500 female slave laborers from concentration camps. Uh, the fact that he acquired um, battery companies in, in, in France who were seized from Jews 
uh, that he used in his, on his private estate, uh, prisoners of war and forced labor, you know, you inspire responsible leadership by being trans by again, at the very least, at the bare minimum, being transparent uh, about history. And, uh, you know, if you, that's not what you want to do, then you should not name your foundation after Herbert Quant. If, you, if you're not willing to own up to it, you know, because then it becomes just a, a upset, it, it becomes obscene and a whitewash at that. So, and David, you know, your book focuses on these families that, that um, are kind of coalesce around the automobile industry. Um, and that's interesting in its own right. But do you right. think if you dug into other aspects of big German corporations, it would be the same story? Or is there something particular about these automotive conglomerates and the people that ran them? Or is this kind of a guilt that's not really you know, been looked at? Right. No, no. I mean, it's 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 omnipresent. I mean, I chose these five families. Part of them have their ties to the the, the car industry, uh, to the automotive industry, but I chose I picked these families because they're still relevant in German. They're sorry in global business today, mm -hmm. right? The Krups and the Thyssens, for example, uh, are not, um, and and these are you know these are today they're they're Germany's and Europe's leading business families to an extent also global and that's why i picked uh these five um it wasn't with a with a car angle in mind i mean it happened that the quants of course you know the car industry is the backbone of the german economy so it's not to no surprise that the quant family came perhaps to an extent it's, it's no surprise that part of the quants came to control bmw after the war they owned different businesses during the third reich um, that the Porsche PX, of course, uh, we started with with, uh, with 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 the Porsche car design firm, and who who helped design the Volk Volkswagen, still control the Volkswagen Group today, um, and that the Flix, also after the war, came to control Daimler Benz, which they no longer do today. But of course, this being such a major aspect of German of of, of the German economy and of the you know of the European economy. It's no surprise that the concentration is very heavily in the in the car industry, but if you if I would look into other industries, which I also do in the book, it would be a similar story. You actually write in the last or second to the last chapter uh, about another family, the Ryman family, mm -hmm. and uh, with with perhaps even and we don't have to go into details. We'll leave it for people to, to right. discover. Uh, but perhaps even closer ties and fiercer uh, ideology connections to the Nazis, um, yeah. and and they control brands, uh, you know, ranging from uh, uh, or are involved with brands ranging from Pete's Coffee, a yeah. personal favorite of mine, to, yeah. to Keebler Cookies. Uh, you know, uh, how sh how should we as consumers? I mean, how do you think that? I mean, what should we be asking or demanding, or or is this really just on the families themselves to to do to do what's right? But what what involvement should we? What reaction should we have as consumers? I mean, I use the Ryman as a as a kind of a positive counterexample where they do where they where they were confronted with they were they were confronted with their bizarre Nazi history of their patriarchs, both very committed Nazis, even set in the municipality donors to the SS. Um, and you know their mother, who turned out to be of Jewish descent, a, a and, and their grandfather was murdered in the Holocaust. So you know they have this bizarre story, very tragic story of being both a descendant from a perpetrator and a victim. But and I give them because they they have they 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 um, uh, established this foundation, the Alfred Landecker Foundation, named after their grandfather was murdered in the Holocaust. Um, and they're both transparent about, but also still being transparent about their grandfather and their father who were major Nazis uh, or convicted Nazis or, or convinced ideological Nazis, even though their business was relatively comparatively small um, in relation to the other families I'm writing about. I mean, now the Reimans are one of Germany's wealthiest uh, families, but sure. back then they were not. That, that, that only came in the post-war era. You know, I think consumers should always make up their minds for themselves. But I think as consumers, the bare minimum what we can expect is if you are going to name corporate headquarters, if you're going to name products, if you're going to name 
you know, media prizes, if you're going to name, you know, global f uh, foundations in the name of Nazi perpetrators or Nazi sympathizers or both, at the very minimum, you should expe expect them to be transparent about that history. I mean, that's literally the bare minimum I'm, 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 the argument of the book puts forward. Um, and you know, if they, if they don't want to do that, they should, they should not be named after these, these products, you know, I think from a consumer perspective should not be named or, or these foundations or prizes or, or corporate headquarters should not be named after these men if they don't want to do that. I mean, that's the bare minimum, I think that, that, that consumers should expect. So like, uh, what are the, what are the other things that, that I'm curious to get your thoughts on? I was struck, you know, I touched on this at the beginning of our conversation where we talked about how Germany is well known for its efforts to remember what had happened and uh, sure. as a remembrance culture. Absolutely. Um, but you also say that this is kind of the, the secret that everybody in Germany knows and nobody talks about. Yeah. So, well, yeah, what, it's not even a secret, you know. So what does this say about Germany's remember Germans remembering the war and 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 all of that um is you know it, is I, it genuine is it is it Bob, I think it's is, very genuine okay, I think it's so very genuine how, I think it's like what we see in many other countries including the United States or hmm. the United Kingdom or, or my native Netherlands is that you know the wealthiest and most powerful often do not want to play by the rules of the rest of society or at least in terms of morality <laughs> and, and historical transparency I mean it's a it's a global problem right I mean you see this in this particular instance in Germany, although Germany has met many other societal problems um, uh, uh, related and unrelated to its to its dark history. But but you see it, you know, you see it. Unfortunately, you see it everywhere. I think Germany has an incredibly has done an incredibly good job at reckoning with its history, uh, reckoning with its Nazi history, and it's. But I also feel that to an extent, and I said this earlier to you guys, um, you know, there's also this sense of you know, a, a media story breaks, um, you know, these families uh, in response, a media story about a business family or company breaks um, about a patriarch or, or their company's, uh, you know, brutal uh, third Reich uh, history and their activities during that, they commission a study in academic German to a, to a prominent uh, uh, academic, the study comes out and then nothing changes. They don't, you know, the findings of the study, and and in a sense, it's also these stories are contained to Germany, because I I also feel that they lean these companies and these families lean on this this notion of collective guilt in Germany, where it's like yeah, but we were all involved, right? You know, so what's new here, really? You know, yeah, and if you want to look it up, you can look it up in this twelve hundred page book, uh, written in dense academic German, but then it, that always also goes for me at least. The question is, who then exactly is this reckoning with? Right, because you're not reaching the majority of of surviving uh, victims uh, of these families or their companies, uh, who are, of course, for the most part, not German, um, and you're also not, you know, you're also not, yeah, you're not, you're not true, having a true true reckoning if you're not transparent about it afterwards. If you then go on pretending like nothing happened. Yeah. On the last page of your book, you write the reigning generation of heirs still has the chance to alter course before passing their empires along to commit fully to historical transparency and moral responsibility and to strive unconditionally to repay to society the enormous debt to society that their fathers incurred after all this work how likely do you think that is to happen i've i've you know, I'm 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 an optimist, so I'm going to say, likely. I think you know. You know the the men and women, women, the current generation of heirs. They're in the uh, they're ranging from their 40s to their uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, you know, I I have good hope that they are that you know, regardless of my book, that they are going going to. Uh, come to a change and, and going to do the right thing, which again, at the very least, is a is is showing in a transparent and global way um, the, the 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 war crimes that their 
um, that their patriarchs or their fathers and grandfathers committed, you know, alongside celebrating their business successes. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say it's likely. Uh, I, I I'm an optimist. I'm going to say this change is 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 going to come. You know, many companies. I, I take Allianz as a, as a prominent example, but it's no longer controlled by a family. Is doing that. If you go to the Allianz website, they're incredibly detailed in English about um, about how they robbed uh, policyholders, how they how they insured concentration camps, how they paid out policies. On, on, or I didn't pay out policies to 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 murder to people who murdered in uh, extermination camps. Um, you know they're very transparent about that. You know, and that's a, that's a historical transparency that one should strive for because that's how you learn from history. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm sound like a broken record here, but it is show by showing the good and the bad. You know. Well, you're to be commended, David, for for being able to. Um have an optimistic feeling at the end, at the end of this process. I mean, it, it yeah, that's the uh, biggest surprise for me yeah. <laughs> coming out of this, but it's nice to hear. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I David, mean, David DeYoung, thank you so much for joining us today on history happy hour. And, um, uh, uh, David's book of course is Nazi billionaires, the dark history of Germany's wealthiest dynasties in early May. You're doing a two week book tour in Germany. So I'll be interested to know how that, not that it won't be well received, because I imagine it will be well received, but I'll just be interesting to hear kind of how, how that compares with, with how it's received in the U.S. and sort of what you learn or what kind of reactions yeah, you get yeah, I mean, as you're going along and doing yeah. that. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Rick and Chris. And uh, again, congratulations on the 100th episode. It was an honor thank to you. be there in this milestone episode. <laughs> okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And, and uh, uh, you'll be care. happy to know that folks are saying that they've already bought the book on Amazon. So Yeah, oh, so, woo -woo. Good. okay, so it's thank happening. You. All right, thanks so much. Thanks, David. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, I, I do want to make a mention of uh, all of our great supporters on Patreon, yes. but specifically, 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 sp specifically our top shelf patrons uh, who are listed here. Uh, if your name's not on here, you can go to patreon.com slash history happy hour uh, to find out how to get your name on there. And of course, to all of our patrons, whether they're top shelf patrons or not, we do appreciate all you guys uh, being here uh, and, uh, you know, and and helping support uh, our efforts to to put history out there. Uh, and Chris, next week we are uh, going to talk about some more bad people, more odious individuals. Yes, <laughs> more uh, odious individuals, <laughs> but of a slightly well, they're kind of Nazi related. But uh, what's up? What's up next dressed. week? They're better yeah, dressed. Yeah. What's the story with next week uh, here with well, the book uh, "The Traitor King"? Yes, we're kind of talk going into some of the uh, the details of um, just how involved uh, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor got in supporting. Um, the Nazis and right-wing fascist movements, and Andrew Lani has some uh, pretty startling evidence that suggests that um, the once King of England was an out-and-out -out traitor to his country. So, and says as seen on TV, but I would yes. say as will be seen on History Happy Hour. There you go. So, uh, thank you everybody for joining Thanks, us everyone. today. It's Stay been great. Safe.